And we are back. Carmine, how you doing? I'm doing good. Back are we for the second part of the G-Steph Cushing Library, Secrets of the Cushing Library. Um, <clears throat> so he combined a cl the Clash of Kings and Storm of Sword drafts together. But for this one, we're just going to tackle Clash of Kings. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the the ACOC. Yes. Um, <laughs> By the way, before you continue on, I forgot to tell you, there was actually another person who went to the Cushing Library that we briefly talked about. Um mm. Some person named Honeybee, I think it was, and uh, I'll have to show you this later. I, 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 we did this like over a year ago, and I always thought it was just G stuff, but no, it was another person. I think they were Honeybee, but um, they just found out a couple of, of of minor things. And the other thing I wanted to get out of the way is we had this discussion privately, and I know the audience is going to ask, "What about the dance for a uh, dance of dragons drafts?" You were telling me how G stuff combined it together with the feast because feast was originally one book and. George well, right. George George had combined them. I mean, he um, he he didn't know he was going to split the books until he was, you know, a good eight hundred man. I mean, eight hundred manuscript pages in, you know, and then mm -hmm. and then split out the the dance portion and then continued to just um, finish feast. He thought it was going to be one book, um, and then other stuff like related to dance as it went further is is i think it might be locked up and not released until winds of winter is out or something mm -hmm. uh, there there are there are things at the cushing library that are not accessible to the public okay yeah i did not know that part actually mm -hmm. um <clears throat> when we uh, excuse me when we eventually finish the uh, when we eventually finish all the drafts the uh, game of thrones we already did clash of kings and storm of swords we're going to have G stuff on and just ask him some questions, shoot the shit with him. So yeah, yeah, sure thing. Um, so let's get into it. A clash of Kings. Um, so this is what G stuff says. He says, welcome to uh, part two of my 2024 series. Um, <clears throat> so his first thing, he says, a clash of Kings, the glass candles. Now this is, this is probably the, the juiciest thing I would say he found in the entire trip. Um, the Cushing, um, it contain, he, the Cushing Library contains one draft of A Clash of Kings, uh, essentially from June 1997. The book was published in 98. Uh, um, there's another final draft with no substantial changes. This, dra this draft uh, had 31 chapters, um, 567 manuscript pages, roughly 48% of the final text. Um, you can see, you can see the, stra the, the chapter structure. Sadly, it doesn't include uh, the most important chapter for foreshadowing Danny's vision of the House of the Undying. But he felt that the most interesting change was a Clash of King draft relates to something that was hint hinted at in the A Feast for Crows prologue um, and that George has been wrestling with how to introduce the glass candles. And he was he was thinking about introducing them long before Feast was published. Um, so what we're talking about here is in a feast for crows at the um in the prologue um lazy leo mentions that a glass candle is burning in um archmaster marwin's um chambers and then at the end of the book in the in, the, in sam 5 the final chapter of a feast for crows sam goes up to those chambers he sees the glass candle and he actually stares into it and loses time. And so, um, and then in A Dance with Dragons, we have Quaith kind of visits Danny and she, she claims that she's, the glass candles are burning. So you were, we're thinking that, um, you know, uh, she's using one. But the glass candles are essentially a device that allows communication over, over a, a distance where you can enter someone's dream um and or at least that's how we understand it currently in the story but um uh and he, they they mention other things that there's four glass candles in the world and there's some suspicion that perhaps maester Eamon was was getting uh glass candled by someone on his trip on his trip back and then we start thinking of all the different dreams that people have in the series and whether or not a glass candle is the reason that they are uh, are getting interfered with were um, you the one that said the glass candles can be used to also like make projections? Well, I mean, what the what the, 
it's it's hard to say what the projection is. Like when Danny uh, sees Quaith in A Dance with Dragons, is Quaith physically there or is Danny unconscious? Um, is you know is is Danny the only one seeing it or not? We're, Danny's the only one there, so it's hard to really say. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think personally that it's all in somebody's head. I don't think that there's any physical manifestation myself or any projection. But uh, I think there people are sending their consciousness um, across and bl- into somebody else's mind. I'm sure the connection has been made before between this, the glass candles and ice and fire, and the uh, Palantir in Lord of the Rings. You know the Palantir? Yes. The, yes. the crystal ball that, yeah. Yeah. And obviously the, the the glass candles are also a parallel to the weirwood nets. They're just the fire version of it or something, you know? So you have your ice version and you have your fire version. Just like the so, whites. Yeah, yeah. So, like, people enter the Weirwood net and they can enter people's dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, across across a distance and people enter the, the glass candle and they can enter people's dreams across, across, a, across a distance. Um, so. So this is what this is what uh, now originally in the Clash of Kings, we know there's only one mention of the glass candles. It's the first mention of the glass candles, but Danny is in Karth and she hears that Earthon Nightwalker has been using glass candles. That's all we kind of hear about it. But um, apparently there was many more glass candles in this original draft of a Clash of Kings. So g says, there's no new lore here, just stuff that eventually made it into Feast. But it's interesting that George tried to make the ignition of glass candles coincide with the arrival of the red comet a few pages later he seems to connect them more directly there's a passage in the published version of this chapter where crescent thinks about the comet before going to bed originally it read like this yet when he closed his eyes he could see the pale bright flame of the glass candle burning steadily against the inside of his eyelids as he watched it grew into the comet red and fiery and vividly alive amidst the darkness of his dreams. Um, there's also a deleted line after he wakes up uh, about him having had dark, terrible dreams, perhaps somehow prompted by the glass candle. And after he falls and Melisandre uh, helps him up at the feast, Crescent has this deleted thought. She knows why the glass candle burns, what the comet pretends. She is wiser than you, old man. In retrospect, the last line of this chapter was originally written as a callback to Crescent's ominous glass candle. Here is the published version. As the cowbells pealed in the antlers, singing fool, 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 while the red woman looked down upon him in pity, the candle flames danced in her red, red eyes. So that's the published version of... um, of... A Clash of Kings. And, um, well, hold on a second. I'm going to go to just making sure that that, uh, oops, what am I doing here, man? A search. But what he's, what he's saying, I'm just making sure that's the, the last line. Yeah, that's it. Crescent tried to reply, but the words were caught in his throat. His cough became a terrible thin whistle as he strained and sucked in air. Iron fingers tightened around his neck as he sank to his knees. He still, uh, still, he shook his head, denying her, denying her power, denying her magic, denying her God. And the cowbells pealed in the antlers, singing fool, 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 while the red woman looked down upon him in pity. The candle flames dancing in her red, red eyes. So that's a remnant, but it's still, you know, he still thought it was um, worth putting in there. Um, Because it still sounded pretty, but originally it had a double meaning of, or the candle flames were were glass candle flames in her red, red eyes. So it's a pretty big plot point that every single maester now has a working glass candle. So in the the published version, there's only a few of them, but in the original, original drafts, everybody had one. Yeah. Yeah. So what we find here is that 
like later in the Tyrion chapter, Tyrion runs into Pycelle and Pycelle's glass candles, glass candle has, has ignited. Behind the shelves, hidden in ornate lacquer screen, he stumbled on a tiny windowless alcove where a tall black candle was burning atop a carved marble shelf. Something about it made Tyrion want to examine it more closely, and then he knew, uh, but he knew he was running short on time. He made a hasty retreat back to the table and was peeling another egg when Grand Maester Pycelle came creeping back down the stair. And then... He says, Lord, please, please, you must heed me. You are in danger, all of you. Grave danger, the realm. There's so much you do not know. Secrets, the hidden mysteries. The glass candle is burning. It's true, I swear. Spare me, and I'll show you the conclave. You must send me to Old Town at once. So, um, <clears throat> and then apparently through the rest of Clash of Kings, there's just all these references to the, to the maesters disappearing and all going to Old Town. All the maesters, um, all over Westeros, all of them. Yes. With the exception of Lewin. Um, <laughs> Poor Maester Lewin. Right. But there is a weird, and I, I noticed this. In fact, when we had our conversation with, with, with G. Steph, I sort of said, yeah, there's this one line that, oh, that from, from Clash where Theon goes home and he asks about the, ma- he asks about the maester. And it's such a weird inserted line that it, that it struck me, you know, because we never hear about Theon like liking maesters or whatever. And, you know, there, there's a million people at home that you could ask about. You could ask about the cook. You could ask about the smith. You could ask about a wet nurse. You could ask about, you know, a, a handmaid. But he like goes home and he's like, oh, where's the maester? <laughs> you know, and it and that, the line always stuck out to me. And it turns out when I asked G stuff about it, he's like, he's like, actually, that's one of the remnant lines. Um, so he says, you know, he says, uh, Wendemere keeps the ravens now. Before he's like, oh, where's Wendemere? And they're like, Wendemere's dead. But now he's like, he sleeps in the sea. Wendemere keeps the ravens now. And then the, ad, the, on, the added on thing, but he's gone south to Old Town on some maester's business. You know, so so like the original, I think, is just he sleeps on the sea. Wendemere keeps the ravens now, you know. So this was like, a, I, a ma- was, I wouldn't say it's a yeah. major plot point, but it was a plot point brewing behind the scenes. And clearly all the point of view characters were starting to get cued in that something's going on uh, with Theon and here with Bran. Uh, you mind if I read this? Sure. Uh, with Bran, Bran is listening to petitioners at Winterfell in Bran 2. There's this altered description of Leobald Tallhart's visit. Uh, quote, he talked of whether, he talked of whether Portons and the lax wits of small folks for what seemed like hours, complained that his maesterd had left them to visit the Citadel, and told how his nephew, Benfred, itched for battle. So... Yeah, this is also something I brought up with in our conversation with G-Steph. It's, it's kind of crazy that all the maesters in all of Westeros, except Lewin, went down to the Citadel. They left their post for this gigantic meeting in Old Town, which, and we were talking about this briefly as well, that's kind of insane that, like, the entire realm's scientists, doctors, teachers all get up and leave just to go do this one thing. So... Yeah. And it's very clear that George has been playing around with I mean, here the magnitude of how many glass candles there are, but he's been playing around with what the the, the abilities of the glass candles are too. Um, in the original prologue draft, Pate is not trading a key uh, with with Jack and Hagar. He's trading a glass candle hmm. with with Jack and Hagar. the The entire like iron for gold is is glass for gold in the original, um, and then. The, he, George was playing around with the that the the user of the glass candle gained immortality. Um, oh, yeah, that's it. That doesn't seem to be the case in this clash draft, but in the in the original feast draft, it was that the glass candles also granted the user immortality, mirroring the werewood again because the werewood grants people immor- immortality. Right, you live in that werewood forever, um, but this. But this idea of like the werewood granting immortality and you start thinking about like Euron's mission of 
of what if we can all fly? Like, what if we can all be these, like this, this, we can all be our own heaven, our own religion, our own God and live forever. You know, if he, if he had access to a glass, glass candle, if he's Urathon, what, you know, Nightwalker and all sorts of things, um, you know, cause actually they, they, Euron's, Euron's not supposed to have aged, right? He comes back and he looks the same, you know, or like Melisandre, like, she's not she doesn't age right so there's like these elements of immortality linked with like uh like objects and so the idea is that you know the glass candles would be would be like the werewoods and grant grant immortality but it doesn't seem that that george has added that and then taken away that ability with the um in the clash of kings i don't think you and i ever really discussed it but um melisandre in the show uh, the fact that mm. she hasn't aged is like quickly answered. Uh, apparently, it's this thing in her in her her uh, necklace, and her necklace, uh, yeah, and it's that, just all glamoured, yeah. It's all glamour. So you think that there's something to that? Because the moment she kind of like takes it off after the Battle of Winterfell in season eight. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think George has thought about that. There's definitely some weird lines about how long um, she's she's lived. And how long she studied, you know, she, t- I think she says something about years beyond count or something that she's studied something years beyond count, um, which, you know, maybe she, maybe she can't count very high. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but, uh, I think beyond count. Yeah. Melisandre had practiced her art for years beyond count and she had paid the price. There was no one in her order who had the skill of see, uh, seeing the secrets half revealed and half concealed within the sacred flames. So, you know, there's this hint that she's actually super old. You know, but uh, she doesn't seem to have a glass candle, but she has flames, which kind of do the same thing as glass candles. You know, you, you can go and <laughs> see things from afar, maybe go into people's dreams. Hmm. Um, anyway, evidently in this draft, the Citadel quickly became aware of the glass candles were burning, considered a big deal. Um, according to Pycelle, it put the realm in grave danger. And so the, uh, they called the conclave to discuss the ramifications. This is different from how they're treated in A Feast for Crows. There, Marwyn seems to be the only maester aware, uh, that they now work again. And, you know, in some of the early drafts, like Marwyn has rather public like arguments with the other with the other maesters. Um, but again, that's that's all kind of. Isn't that like the, like the main thing about Ice and Fire, though, about the story is how there, like, there's this impending danger that no one seems to care, care either care about or, or just they gloss it over. And there's only that one, maybe one or two people who really know, know what's going on. Isn't that the it's whole thing? True. That's true, and then nothing, nothing seems to be, ha- and then nothing seems to happen for books and books and books. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, nearly all of this was deleted, but remember that George did retain one mention of the glass candle, glass candles in Clash, where Zaro tells about the strange magical phenomenon. And so it was then, but how? Um, it is said that the glass candles are burning in the house of Urathon Nightwalker, that have not burned in a hundred years. You know, so. Um, so what does it all mean? Well, here's my guess. Although he really liked the glass candle concept, George, probably with his editors, decided that as magical omens, the candles and the comet were redundant and that the book was getting too long as it was. So he deleted the candles and the conclave subplot from Clash. But with an eye toward coming back to it later, he left that single reference from Zaro as part of the general catalog of weirdness, weirdness without the original Citadel connection. This was George planting a seed while strategically keeping things vague, given the trouble he had trying to make the original glass candle concept work. I agree with that. That's not, that seems like what it, either that or he forgot, but I, sure. I, I mean, but it, it's like anything else, like, like for instance, um, the, the rats chewing off their own tail, like, that doesn't that doesn't mean you know he could he could he leaves it so ambiguous that had he never 
ta- like brought this up again, glass candles burning in the house of Arathon Nightwalker, and then decided to like drop it completely, he could drop it. And we would just have it as a random freaking thing that happened in Karth, like rats chewing off their tail. But he did bring it back. So now, you know, it's it's significant. But he could have, he, he really, he you know, he kicked the can down the street and he did come back to it in, in, uh, in Feast, but, you know, this was just kicking the can down the Feast. Like him leaving one glass candle reference is, is fairly, fairly meaningless. By the way, um, Urathon yeah. Nightwalker, are you coming back to that guy? Well, Urathon Nightwalker is kind of, is kind of funny. Many people... Because later we hear about Uragon and maybe in, in a, maybe in a World of Ice and Fire there's an Urathon. It's a it's a it's a Ironborn name. Um, I think oh you know what it is in a World of Ice and Fire they reference the same guy but but I think they call him Urathon once and Uragon another time. Urathon good brother Urathon good brother. But I think Urathon Good Brother is called Uragon Good Brother in in the in the text of A Dance with Dragons. So yeah, it is. So Uragon the third, Uragon the the fourth. So it definitely sounds like you know it sounds like a, a an Ironborn name, and we know that. We know that Euron, well, Euron sounds like Urathon to start with, but Urathon sounds like a Ironborn name. It seems to be an Ironborn name in, in, in the world of Ice and Fire, Uragon. We know that Euron was near Karth around the time Danny was because he picks up the, the warlocks and he has the warlocks. So Euron being Urathon Nightwalker is not much of a stretch. You know, he could easily be him Mm -hmm. if you wanted him to be. Because Euron was in that area. And Euron seems to be maybe going... Somebody's been going into Aaron Dampere's head. And maybe it's Euron. So, you know, you throw all these things together. You're like, "Eh, yeah, your Earth on Nightwalker could could easily be Euron, you know. I, I feel like I've I've heard that theory before. Uh, out of all the Euron Greyjoy theories, you know him being Benjen or him being uh, mm, Dario, yeah, yeah, I kind of like that. this one the most. I, I feel like I've heard this one before, but possibly not. Also, Eurathon being in the uh, uh, World of Ice and Fire was that Elio and Lindo, or was that George? I always I, I hate to be that person that always asks because I do know that Elio and Lindo came in and, and they did do their own thing with that. So I'm wondering if because if, if that's George, then there it is. But if it's Elio and Linda, then. Mm, Take it with a grain of salt. Right. Um, here, here, I, I, you know, it depends if it's an aside. Let's see. Earthon, Earthon, good brother. And then there's an Ergon, Earthon, peak. Earthon, good brother, the bad brother. Um, and then it says N1. In A Dance with Dragons, your Urathon is called Uragon, good brother, where in the world of ice and fire, uh, they call him Urathon. It has been suggested... It has... Oh, it had. It has been suggested to change the spelling in A Dance with Dragons instead of the world of ice and fire, making Urathon the correct spelling. It sounds like... It sounds like George... It sounds like George, like George, went and put Urathon in the World of Ice and Fire, and they went back and asked him, and then he he somehow, and then he's like, "Oh, sorry, Uragon is a misspelling." Mm, okay. Um. Here, here, here is actually Linda talking about it. Uragon, this one should have been fixed years ago. Correction on this. Something about this niggled at me, and I checked through my emails again and see the reason it wasn't fixed is that there was a notion 
of perhaps adjusting a dance with dragons instead of the world of ice and fire i don't know the status of that so it sounds like they they at least asked him about it but <laughs> you know that it wasn't it wasn't elio and linda that it was that it was george once class was done george had had a huge set of fully developed plans for Storm and had no room to introduce anything else in that book. But once Clash shot to the top of the bestsellers list and A Song of Ice and Fire started to become a big deal in the publishing world, he decided to take his time on the next book and include all the stuff he wanted to include in the previous books but hadn't have had time for, including the Citadel and the Ironborn plots, which are basically the first two things he worked on for Feast. Um... You know, it's hard to say on this. Uh, um, I don't know if he's like intentionally taking his time. Um, but I do get a sense that George had realized that this was. Um, and a lot of writers do this. They re- he, they realized this was this was a cash cow and decided to stretch out the series. Um I mean, Charles Dickens, Charles Dickens did this, but, but certainly uh, Robert Jordan talked about doing this, that like, oh, this is my, this is my income. I better put out, I don't want to finish this up too fast. Well, props to Robert Jordan for actually being honest about that. I, I, that he gets my respect for that because I hate when people try to bullshit their way out of that Mm. because it's, it's very clear. Like, look, you know, if you, you love, you enjoy writing stories and you want to keep making that money. But I, I feel like it's a bit of both with George. Like, obviously, you know, he wanted to make his money and he had all these ideas he wanted to put in and couldn't before in the second book, but here's the third one. So people were certainly surprised with Feast going in a completely utter different direction. And what does this mean for the story? Given that the glass candle material was specifically deleted and then replaced with other glass candle material in A Feast for Crows, I don't think we can read uh, much into it. But if I had to draw conclusions, it would be these. George originally meant for both the candles and the comet to have been triggered by the return of magic, or perhaps just fire magic in the world. Which in turn was prompted by the birth of dragons. This isn't a novel theory, but the more explicit uh, candle timing and candle comet prose linkage in the draft uh, draft clash prologue suggests George considered them all connected. Certainly all connected. I think there's a causation um, issue and problem, right? Like is the comet, are the dragons, you know, is the comet causing the dragons, which is causing the candles, which is causing the wildfire. Because remember the wildfire discussion in A Clash of Kings where where the wisdom is like, are there any dragons around? We produced more wildfire than we thought. Is Are there any dragons around? And Tyrion's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, so there's definitely like, there's definitely a, re- a return of magic um, like element that we're supposed to think about, right? And I don't know the causation. You know, is it is it the dragons causing the comet? Is it the dragons causing the, the we don't think about anything causing the comet, right? We think of the cut co- like the comet being independent. Um, it's hard to believe that the dragons would pull a comet in. So maybe the comet caused everything. I don't know. I always thought, think, in, in, in my opinion, I always thought the comet just amplified the dwindling magic in the world. That magic will dwindle every now and then. It'll go away, and then some event like this will come, and it will flare the fuck up. Right. So, I mean, you're 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 on board with essentially, not literally, but thematically, comet is a Vulcran. That like <laughs> is that what the, it is? I, okay, I'll take well, it. Well, the Vulcran the Vulcran enhances people's like telepathic and telekinetic abilities when it's near, right? So like, um, if so, if the comet is a Vulcran, the comet is enhancing magic. Or you know what, or maybe telepathic telekinetic abilities, mm-hmm. you know, when it's near, that's it. Uh, and then he said that he he wanted, and then he thought that he wanted Pycel at the Citadel and the Citadel to be freaked out by this because the Citadel had a hand in the elimination of dragons and thus magic from the world roughly 151 years ago. Yeah, you know, I think that's that's fair. Um, that there. 
I mean, that that same connection is being made in A Feast for Crows. So, you know, they're they're linking the Citadel and, and dragons and, and magic together um, as some sort of event. Um, but really, the material is 27 years old at this point. It's interesting, but whatever plans George had for the Glass Candles and the Citadel then have been overtaken by later books. That's true. And then, okay. <clears throat> anyway, anything anything more you want to talk about Glass Candles or do you want to move on to uh, Cersei's Mole? Uh, I, I really wanted to know, like, what the plan was for, for the Glass Candles going forward in the original draft. I mean, if I were to guess about the Glass Candle, and, and, I, and I think, you know, I, I push the the fan fiction in, in this direction that George loves the idea of the all powerful shut in this person that's in a room that has power over all sorts of things in the realm. I think Sam is positioned to be, to be like Bran where he is sitting in front of a glass candle, sending, seeing the world, sending himself out, affecting change in his environment. And keep in mind that the Citadel is very similar to the Weirwood where, you know, you have all of this knowledge the Weirwood has it within the trees, but the, the Citadel has it within books. Um, you have all of this knowledge, and then you have a character who can, from their little, you know, immobile place, can affect change in the entire in the entire world. And so I think you have, you know, these twin kind of ideas, one of ice and one of fire. And um, you know, he, he may have cut the idea that the glass candles have have immortality. But I don't necessarily think it's that important, you know. Um, um, but uh, uh, I don't know. That's the, the, that's kind of that's kind of how I see it going forward. That that um, and you know maybe it relates to Euron about Euron wanting to create his own house of the undying or his own his own. Uh, religious network of 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 minds that would continue on forever like like the werewood net but that that would be my guess you know that it's something that it's a that it's just at the at the end of the day another werewood is what it is it's just an it's just a fire werewood mm. would be my would be my guess by the way, um, earlier we mentioned Fire White. That's not in the books, but this is something that George said. I remember George, George said, yeah, yeah, him talking about that specifically. In case people were confused by that, he yeah, called John exactly. a Fire White. Yeah, which means you'd assume that like Lady Stoneheart and Beric Dondarrion or whatever, or Fire Whites or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, Cersei's mold. Cersei's Mole. So this is like kind of a random scene. The second interesting set of changes in the draft of Clash relates to Tyrion's attempt in uh, Clash of Kings Tyrion IV to flush out the identity of Cersei's informant by feeding Pycelle, Littlefinger, and Varys three different stories about his plans for Cersei's children and seeing which story Cersei learns about. There are some key differences in the draft that may change your understanding, but here's what happened canonically. Uh, but this trick, this change is tr a bit tricky. So before getting into it, recall these details from the published version. Yeah, this is so Tyrion meets Pycelle in his chambers, gives Pycelle two letters containing duplicate copies of an offer to foster Marcella with Prince Doran and instructs Pycelle to send both letters via Raven immediately. This is he, he tells him that, like, he wants to send two because. Uh, in case one gets lost. But really, the reason he gave two is because Pycelle, he's thinking Pycelle would go, well, I can I can just send one and then and then send give the other message to Cersei. Mm -hmm. While waiting for Pycelle to return, Tyrion hears wings and then sees one raven fly from the rookery. Varys arrives at Tyrion's bedchamber roughly an hour later and already knows that Pycelle just sent a secret letter to Doran on Tyrion's behalf. Cersei later is angry at Tyrion for offering Marcella to Dorn, Doran, but not for the other offers he described to Littlefinger and Varys. Tyrion ambushes Pycelle with Shaga, accuses him of giving uh, one of the letters to Cersei. Pycelle denies it, accuses Varys. 
then after harsher threats admits to letting uh, John Aaron die. So, um, it, it, most people don't quest. Most people read this and don't question that Picel was Cersei's mole. It just seems logical that Picel was Cersei's mole. Um, he's pro Lannister, so it just goes without saying. But you could read into these events and say that maybe Tyrion just didn't see the other Raven, um, or missed it, and Picel didn't didn't inform Cersei. Varys did, and and it was pinned on Picel, and Picel was actually like not Cersei's mole. The significance of Varys being Cersei's mole is not that not that much. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like Varys disappears later and it doesn't matter. Okay, so so then so in the in the in the in the draft version. Tyrion sees two ravens go. Here's the differences. Tywin, uh, Tyrion notices two ravens leave, leaving the rookery. Um, technically, in the draft, he saw one but heard two. Varys arrives minutes after Littlefinger leaves, rather than a little under an hour. Varys originally denied knowledge of the substance of Doran's le- letter and instead claims to guess its content rather than saying that his little birds told him. So what's the significance of this? Um, He says, "Uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. My best guess is that George wanted to suddenly indicate that Varys was the real leaker, having Tyrion notice two ravens leaving um, as he almost subconsciously does in the draft. Undermines the theory that Pycelle kept one of the ravens back. Having Varys appear so quickly when summoned in the draft also may have meant as a hint that he was nearby listening to Tyrion's conversations. Um, There's also a connection to the glass candles changes that makes me think of that, at least in the draft. George meant for Pycelle to have been fully honest when interrogated by Tyrion, and Tyrion didn't realize it. The chapter in which Tyrion interrogates Pycelle about the leak also contains the deleted passage in which Pycelle warns that the glass candles are burning and the realm is in grave danger. Tyrion blows that warning off. At the end of the chapter, he notices that the glass candle Pycelle was talking about again and, and cheekily extinguishes it. We know from other drafts, chapters, and future books that the glass candles are real and significant, so Tyrion's reaction here is... is meant to be misguided when you combine it with the fact that Pycelle denies being the leaker, blaming Varys instead, and that Pycelle quickly admits to a number of other crimes. I think that the that the draft cha- chapter, Tyrion meant to be mistaken about Pycelle and that he's been played by Varys. George's decision to go from Tyrion noticing two ravens to noticing one and increasing the amount of time between Varys arriving might indicate that he wanted to drop the idea just to make Pycelle the leaker in the published version. But I personally think Varys could still be the candidate there too. Um, I would say that Varys is the leaker. Um, even, myself. even in the published version? In the published, in the published version. Mm. Um, not that it has any consequences, but Pycelle is unusually honest. <laughs> like he admits to letting a man die. Like he, you know, it, it's over the top and yet he still denies being the leaker to Cersei, you know. So like it, it doesn't it doesn't really make sense that he would admit to this greater crime and not the lesser crime. You know, we also look at like Pycelle and Cersei's relationship in A Feast for Crows is rather strained. Like she doesn't trust the guy at all. And that doesn't really make sense if he's such if he's been leaking to her in A Clash of Kings. You know, that's a good point. Yeah. So. But then again, like it's not like Cersei thinks about Varys very much in A Feast for Crows when she's like, oh, you know, I really needed him. But it's Varys being everyone's friend seems more like the role for Littlefinger, that he be the mm-hmm. one doing this instead of Varys. I don't know. I like I like Varys trying to play all sides. But at the same time, yeah, that's how he uh, that's how he destabilizes the realm for the Blackfires. It's just because we, we also know that Varys is in, is in the walls so he can find out all of this information anyway. And he has little birds everywhere. So it's so easy for him to be to, to take on that role. But like I say, it doesn't it doesn't affect the plot at all. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so here, and I know someone's going to other... ask me this later. Yes, Varys working for the Black Fires. I'm, I'm, I'm. Someone was trying to tell me a theory about how Varys himself may be a secret Black Fire. That's why he shaves his head. I kind of like yeah, that yeah. theory. I it, do. It, I, I like it. It's, it's a good theory. You know, um, it's, it's certainly fun. It, it, or just a secret Targaryen of some sort, secret anything. You know, and that's why he shaves his head. But I also think he has nuts. I also think he has his testicles. So because of that uh, one, that one line where well, who was it that that noticed that he had uh, he had some oh, like Kevin. Uh, Kevin, okay yeah. You know. <laughs> um, I think it's also mentioned because maybe Ned when Ned mentioned meets Rugen, um, but um, his Rugen the Jailer persona in in a, in a Game of Thrones. I'll t- I'll take um, Varys having balls over him being a merman. I'll take that one. <laughs> um. Anyway, the uh, removal of the glass candles um, is the only significant change to the plot, but there's a bunch of small changes. Um. When Jojen and Mira meet Bran, they they uh. There's a deleted line where Jojen approaches Summer and says, go careful, Jojen. Remember what father said. It's not much. Um, There's another deleted passage. Well, he says it's not much, but given how much speculation about the current status of Howland Reed, this at least provides indication that Howland was at home in the neck at the beginning of Clash. (laughs) A variety of characters have tried to contact him, but there's no reports on where he is. Um, So at least he's supposed to be there. Um, at least in, in this version. Um, there's another deleted Bran passage, one chapter earlier, in which Bran wants to ride Dancer into the Great Hall for the Harvest Feast, but Maester Lewin refuses, saying it would be unseemly. The chapter ends with this line from Roderick, You have a stark, you have stark pride, Bran, but the Maester has the right of it. I think riding through the Great Hall, no, we will carry you in. With all dignity and honor, believe me, boy, It'll be, it will be best that way. But riding Dancer into the Great Hall for the feast to hearty cheers for the guests is exactly how Bran, how ne- the Bran's next chapter begins in both the draft and the published book. So the published version loses a bit of context uh, from the draft. It's implied that Bran must be put, um, must have put his foot down and gotten his way and had been proven right. That's true. Um, they're all telling him not to do it. For non-book readers who are confused, Dancer is the horse that Bran, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, we're never, he just he just rides in, and we're like, oh, that's an interesting idea. But here, we find out there's the idea, and everybody's like, don't do it, and he does it anyway. And that tells you, you know, that's a complete, it's a big deal, <laughs> you know, that, he, that he's, that everybody's telling him not to do something, and he does it anyway. Um. Big personality shift. Um, Oh, here's an interesting one. This is really interesting. I'm surprised this didn't get more. But another interesting change comes from the end of Daenerys 2 when she sends Jorah to the docks of Karth looking for ships. As published, Jorah returns with Kahuro Mo, the captain of the Cinnamon Wind, who informs Danny of the death of Robert Baratheon. Originally... John intended for Jorah to return with Dario Naharis. Mm. Yes. Um, this this is um this is a an interesting one because it has his descriptions of what Dario looks like. <clears throat> he says, What would you have of me, Dario Naharis, instead of Gohoromo? Nothing but the honor of serving you, my queen, and the joy of watching your face shine with delight when you hear what I shall tell you. Get on with it, Tyrosh, Sir Jorah growled. Her grace has no taste for hints and feints. As you will, dragon mother Stormborn, fairest of queens, hear my tidings. Robert Baratheon is dead. Outside her walls, dusk was settling. Um, dead. In her lap, black dragon hissed and pale smoke rose. Are you certain the usurper is dead? Dead and buried, your grace. A golden tooth gleamed in his mouth when he smiled. When we set sail from Tyrosh, many moons turned past. The talk was of nothing else. The gods are just. 
Um, so yeah, like at least far as far back as a Clash of Kings, Jorah had this character Dario Naharis in mind and what he looked like. Like he was a Tairashi with a golden tooth. And all of that, you know, and super overly devoted to Danny. But any sort of weird niceness that we get from Kahuro Mo is is seems to be a remnant of him being Daru Naras. Because <laughs> <laughs> Kahuro Mo doesn't really act like that with Sam. Um, you know, he doesn't have the same personality at all. So Dario was always intended to be either George really liked the character and he wanted to save him to have a, a bigger, a bigger, mm. bigger importance uh, and introduce him with then why introduce him with the Stealthsword company? If- yeah. I mean, was he supposed to be the person who that she was going to get on on a ship with? And then you don't have to meet him in Slaver in, in Slaver's Bay. He's already the ship's captain. I mean, I would say that <clears throat> that <laughs> Grolio is kind of a, a it's I mean I would say that it's really weird for for um Illyrio to get Grolio all the way to Karth. But if you're gonna eliminate Grolio, yeah, you you're eliminating Barristan and you can you're not gonna not have Barristan like get, arrive with Danny. That seems like a major, major plot point. So I don't know why she would be running into Dario in Karth if she's not going to take his ship. Um, this is to say if Dar- this is the same Dario, that the same character that we'd get in the, in the published version. And just not right. Just Did he just look swap. at this character and go, oh, I kind of like this character. That's who Danny is going to be boning later. And I... And I Taking her know, every which way. Right. I mean, I don't know. <sighs> like, did he still want Danny to, to meet and bone someone in Slaver's Bay? It's just that he had this character that he fleshed out in Karth, and he's like, damn, yeah, I'll just use this one, and then swapped him out for Kahuro Mo. Hmm. Anyway, this is, um... Yeah, in this version, he swears himself to Danny immediately... And Stormy only does this on the second meeting. So I guess he, 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 he swears himself immediately and then follows Danny. I would imagine that George's plan was that Grolio and, and Barristan would arrive and Dario would still just be in her service. Right. And, on, on, and then along for the ride um, with his ships behind her or something in tow. I don't know. Um. Yeah, she invites him to dinner so she can hear his tales of, of his voyage from Tyrosh. So she's getting to know him in Karth. And then the deletion wasn't done for space, doesn't make but it doesn't make a ton of sense for a Tyrashi sellsword in Karth to be the person bringing Danny the news from Westeros. I suspect that George originally introduced him in this chapter because he wanted to emphasize the pattern of Jorah warning Darren Danny not to trust anyone. I mean, I think I think personally he he wanted to introduce her next romantic interest, but it just didn't really work to to have him be introduced at that point. You know, it makes more sense to, you know, in Slaver's Bay. I suspect Jorah originally introduced him as a character because he wanted to emphasize the pattern. Um Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the news works just as well. I mean, I'm trying to think about this. Like, the news of Robert Baratheon dying, it being in Tyrosh. Like, Tyrosh isn't that far from Westeros. So, yeah, he could hear about the news. And then he would bring the news to Karth. It's, I mean, it's not that different than Kahuro Mo being in Old Town. It's, not, it's not, not significant. Not significant. Like, the news location of of Tyrosh and... And uh, Old Town, it's not not that different. Um, there's only one substantial deleted passage from the John chapters, a flashback to a conversation with Sam, Gren, and Pip before he left on the Great Ranging. Pip, Pip offered to trade places with Sam 
But Gren says that the deception would never work. Well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> There's another, I mean, it's weird though, right? Because Gren's the stupid one. Why is Pip making that? It should be the other way around, really. Like, the Gren would be like, I'll swap with you. Because Gren's the dumb one, right? Anyway, this is another likely brevity deletion. It adds nothing to the story. Save George two-thirds of a page. Um, there's one small deletion from another John chapter that likely does have story significance. A conversation between John and Mor Mormont about Maester Eamon's biography early in John 1. The draft contains this deleted exchange. The old bear gave a lo loud snort and the raven took flight, flapping in a circle about the room. If I had a man for every vow I've seen broken in my day, the wall would not lack for defenders, I promise you. Especially when it might have been you, John. You are the elder, are you not? By a few turns of the moon, but Rob is trueborn. That is what that is what he shares with Maester Eamon. Um so one of the one of the amb ambiguous things is that we don't know who's older, John or Rob. John looks older, but it it would only make sense if John were younger, because Ned is married not necessarily at the beginning of the war, but at the beginning of his participation in the war. So, and he he fathers Rob on Catalan at you know, the right after the Battle of the Bells. So he's, you know, Rob needs, and then the story is, is that Ned went off and was warring and then, you know, had sex with somebody else. So logically speaking, John should be younger, but John looks older. And here we find out that John claims he is older, but if John's older, then the entire story of him being Ned's bastard falls apart. That makes sense. You know, so, you know, they would have to, he would have to delete it. But yeah, I mean, G stuff says the Sam published books have no indication whether John or Rob is older, but if John is older than the story of Ned fathering him makes in Robert's rebellion makes it impossible. Yes. <clears throat> and the, <clears throat> Um, the same passage also makes one small change to Maester Eamon's biography as published he chose to go to the wall to avoid undermining his younger brother in the original draft Aegon was the one who sent him there to avoid being compared to Eamon the published version makes Eamon more noble and Aegon and Egg more of a douche <laughs> sending his brother away to the wall <laughs> doesn't sound like egg at all uh the clash the clash draft chapters have a deleted connection between john and aria there's a deleted line near the end of aria 3 where she thinks of john while falling asleep when aria's eyes finally closed it seemed as though her brother john was with her he smiled at her but something in his eyes looked sad and she knew he had something important to tell her they set it together. Winter is coming. Aww. Aww. The, the half-siblings that want to bang. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't was to say that, but okay. Well, I mean, that was the original plan, right? Yeah. The, the fucking... The, the, the triangle with her, Tyrion, and Jon. Yeah. Interestingly, the next chapter is Jon 3. It ended... Its end has a deleted mention of John thinking of Arya. Suddenly he remembered how he used to muss Arya's hair, his little stick of a sister. He wondered where she was now. It made him a little sad to think he would never muss her hair again. Aww. Sibling love. Not in that way, but sibling love. I mean, yeah. I mean, muss her hair. Why we... <laughs> Is that the reference to musser, musser hair? <laughs> it 
Anyway, yeah, we we know we know what Jon Snow is good at. Eager, <laughs> eager tells us. Eager tells us what John's what John's good at. So Jesus. Uh, um, George was clearly setting up the two of them to have an intersection again. The fact that he deleted the passages and that three books later it still hasn't happened may indicate that he changed his mind. Um, in the Sansa chapters, we have some small changes where her dialogue with Dantos about with her dialogue with Dantos about escaping. Originally, Dantos planned for something else to row someone else to row Santa out to sea during the escape. Um, taking from the castle, it would be the hardest. Once you're out, I know a lad with a little skiff for a bit of coin and a taste of wine. He'd row you out to sea. These are fisher folk, I know. He's a mute, so he asks no questions and he gives no answers. A mute. Icy needles scraped up Sansa's uh, spine. The king's justice was mute, and the very sight of Sir Illyn filled her with dread. When would this be? Could we go now? This very night? No, my lady, I fear not. First, I must speak to my friends and find a sure way to get you from the castle. When the hour is ripe, it will not be easy nor quick. They watch me as well. As you can see, Dantos origi- uh, originally Dantos also hinted that someone else was directing the plan when he said he was in need of his friends, Littlefinger, although another deleted line. There's no other hints of who this mute might be, but evidently it was an abandoned subplot. subplot. Yeah, I mean, another mute. I mean, you, everyone, like the fans would just be like another a little bird. What's going on? You know, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah. Not much to that, but okay. And um, and some other quick hits. Danny's dragon Rhaegal was originally named Rhaegor. Uh, Sir Gregor's torturer, the Tickler, was originally named the Piper. Harrenhal, the Harrenhal whore, Pretty Pia, was originally named Pretty Mia. Zaro Zoendaxis was originally named Jaro Joendaxis. <laughs> The Greyjoy banner was originally supposed to have three tails streaming from it like the arms of a kraken. And when Renly dies, there's a deleted line in which Catelyn is said to stand still as stone. I'm skeptical that this was meant as a Stoneheart foreshadowing, but uh, the same draft has the line in which Catelyn looks her reflection in in some breastplate and sees the face of a drowned woman. So it's possible. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's definitely foreshadowing. Well, that's definitely foreshadowing of her of her dying, and getting thrown in the river. But who knows about still as stone and and um, and Stoneheart. All right, and that's it. That's uh, that's the differences uh, between the uh, what George was doing during Clash. So the major thing being the glass candles. Um, oh yeah. I don't know if I like that every maester had one because it, it kind of reminds me of the um, of the one of the the, the chains and the when the links in the chain. About how they always they try to uh, light the, the glass candle, but it doesn't. It's just a reminder that some of the mysteries out there, and that everyone. Yeah, didn't. no, I mean, I think what's what's, um, so, all the stuff about it being a mystery and like learning a lesson from it, that's in the Crescent Prologue. Mm-hmm. You know, that's actually like borrowed from the Clash of Kings and brought back and, and dumped in. Um. See, it says here, every maester was given a glass candle on the day he took his vow at the Citadel. They were beautiful things and required careful handling, for each was a foot tall, icicle slender, and covered with delicate tracery. They were wrought of gleaming obsidian, uh, even to the wick. Dragon glass, the small folk called it, black, brittle, beautiful, and so sharp that many a maester had bloodied his fingers on the candles over the years. Like the chains around their necks, a maester's candle was said to be symbolic. The candle is the wisdom you have learned here in the citadel, they were told. They are as beautiful as knowledge, as fragile as truth. They are made in the shape of candles to remind you that you must cast light wherever you serve. And they are sharp to remind you that the knowledge can be dangerous. Wise men some, sometimes grow arrogant in their wisdom, but a maester must be humble. So each morning when you rise, you will try to light your candle. And learn again that even with knowledge, some things are not possible. Right. right. And I actually like that, but I don't know. I, it's it, beautiful. I mean, it's really beautifully written. 
Oh, it's, 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 it is beautifully written, but I, I don't know if I like the idea of like everyone having a glass candle. I, oh, I yes, like the, I, huh? <laughs> too many, too many glass candles. I, yeah, I like the idea that they're very rare and, and, and just sought after and only like certain special people have them. So it, it makes it more unique. Kind of like the, once again, the plant here from Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, one thing, one thing about these ideas is, see, I, I mean, I guess if if you if you have a very superhero um, uh, idea of George, there's this idea that like George has just so many ideas, and he's it's an infinite well. And then there's then there's this other kind of things where it's like actually maybe George is struggling. And that he got to a feast for crows and he didn't know what to do. So he looked for what cut material he had. And he had this cut material on glass candles and was like, okay, I've got this. Let's, let's just, let's get going on this, you know, versus being, you know, rather than it being something that he, he always wanted to put in and that, you know, he was just waiting for the right time and delayed it could very well be that. He'd come up with this thing. He'd cut it because he thought it was a bad idea. And then when Feast for Crows came around, he's like, crap, I need ideas. And he like pulled it out of the trash, you know, essentially cut, pulled his cut stuff and started including it. Because, um, I mean, he includes, you know, he includes text itself, you know, on on what the glass candle means, you know. And I, I, I'm going to be very real with you. I don't like the idea that George just needed stuff to put in there. So we went back to the, the garbage bin and, and, and just inserted it in there because he needed stuff to bat out. I, I want to I say that there's a plan. There's been a plan this entire time. I want to believe that. I want to believe that he knows what he's doing instead of stumbling. I will, I will, I will, say, that, I will say that with Feast, I am inclined to agree with you. Like I, I think with Feast... He he was not. There was not much padding. I think the pad. There, I think there is some padding in dance, but um, I think you are right. I think I think you are right. At least, especially on the first half, like the first the first parts of Feast. You know that that these are. It's filled with his ideas. You know, mm -hmm. like even if you're claiming like oh. Brienne is wandering around or whatever, or, you know, is there real any part? Is there really any purpose for her to go to the quiet aisle and stuff like that? And you're like, okay, okay. But that's near the end, you know, that's near the end of the Brienne story. <laughs> like, um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll say that with the, with the glass candle, I'll admit that I think he, he, he had thought of this and wanted it back and it wasn't just, it wasn't just padding. Tyrion and Volantis, though. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, Tyrion 3? The worst fucking chapter ever? Tyrion, Tyrion 7. Tyrion 7? 7. Worst, worst, worst chapter in Ice and Fire, yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, so that's the Clash drafts. Uh, next time, we will check out the Storm of Swords draft. Yeah, sounds good. Which is going to have some Red Wedding stuff. I, I took, a, took a peek. It's going to have some Red Wedding stuff. It's going to have some Night of the Laughing Tree stuff. To let the audience know, I know for a fact Preston was itching to talk about the glass candles. That's his bread and butter right there. Oh, I mean, I love the glass candles. Glass candles are great. <laughs> I love the glass candles. That's it. That's, that's, that's all, right. all we got. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.